Hello and welcome to my channel In Search of Wonder. My name is Anne and today it is my weekly reading wrap up video with a twist. So if you have been following my channel, you know that my family and I went to Boston for spring break and I was very excited because it coincided perfectly with Alcott April, which I am um, participating in and co-hosting together with Tiffany and Dia and Kelly and Emma and their channels. And I was so excited to have the opportunity to do that. And so I am batch filming today several videos all about our trip to Boston and different aspects of it. So in the next couple of weeks, if you see me looking like this, it's not that I am like this every single day. No, indeed I do shower and change my clothing on a regular daily basis, but I just have time today. I'm off work for spring break. It's still spring break. My husband is at work. My kids are catching up on all their lost video game time and other stuff that they missed out on, you know, while we were on vacation. And so I have time. I'm filming. Anyway, so visiting Boston was initially part of my ongoing city in a day project, which I have not talked about on this channel because um, I believe the most recent one that we did was last summer, like right around the time I started this channel. So the city in a day project is where I choose a city that is within an easy driving or train ride distance from our where we live and we see as much of that city as we can in a day prior to last year i had kind of um kind of sort of done this a little bit more informally i guess you could say without as much of a clear-cut purpose um only because we tend to take quick trips for getaways um we if we go on like a long week long vacation, it's usually with family or to visit family. So actual trips and destinations to visit someplace. Um, we just don't, we, we tend to just take shorter trips throughout the year that we can squeeze in on long weekends or something like that. So um, I have gotten very adept at fitting as much as I can into a short little vacation and packing it full of things that, um, people in the family want to do and want to see. And um, anyway, so that is the project. Boston started out as the next city in a day project for me. And so that was our intention was to take the overnight train up to Boston, walk our feet off all day long in Boston and then take the train back. But as we were planning it, and as I was looking at all of the stuff there was to do in Boston, I was like, okay, there's no way we can do all of this in one day. Plus I wanted to go to Concord to see Louisa Mayocott's house. And then, and it was like 20 minutes by car from Boston. I was like, okay, I cannot come up to Boston and not go see Louisa Mayocott's house. And then on top of that, my husband wanted to see the Norman Rockwell Museum, which is a couple hours drive west of Boston. But again, we were like, we're gonna be up in the area. So we added a third day for that. So it ended up being um, a three day trip. So kind of an extended city in a day. And we mostly did the city in the first day that we were there. So I will have a separate video coming with all about my, um, my city in a day project and how I do it and everything. If that interests anybody, um, it's part, all part of my in search of wonder thing. I, I love to travel. I love to visit new places. I love to see no thing, new things. It's all part of my being in search of wonder, looking for things that interest me and excite me and, and give me things to think about and pause and contemplate and marvel at. So, um, if you hear a bird really loud, I think it's the birds that live in this bush, like right outside the window that I'm filming next to. So they're just chiming in, joining in the conversation today. So just say hello to the birdies. In today's video, I'm going to go through all of the things that we saw in Boston and show you some pictures and just catch you up on what I was doing this past week as part of my weekly reading wrap up. Later this week, I will share another video that specifically focuses on all of the bookish things that I did because I did quite a bit of that, much to the chagrin of some of my family members. I did not do as much as I wanted to do. So um, there's that. Anyway, so 
we had a fantastic time in Boston and I'm just gonna go real quick through all of the things that we saw and all of the things that we did and kind of like rate them, rank them, whatever, and give you an idea of what our trip was like. So first of all, we got off the train. Actually, first of all, we took the train. Here are some views from the train window. And then we got coffee, of course. And then we hit the road running um, at 9.30ish, 10 o'clock in the morning. And once we um, sort our luggage uh, somewhere, we went on the Freedom Trail. So if you're not familiar with Boston and its history, there's a Freedom Trail that takes you through the key spots that were involved in the um, Revolutionary War. And so there are some cemeteries there, there are some churches, there are meeting places, there's the, the Faneuil Hall, which is like a market hall, which was just, you know, like a public forum. Um, there is Paul Revere's house. There's also um, USS Constitution, which was a ship involved in the Revolutionary War. We did not go, that's like a little further out of the way um, and we didn't have time to go there. So we didn't go to that, but we, we stopped by, I believe every other place on the, on the trail. And it's literally, they have made it very conveniently, um, a little brick um, trail in the sidewalk and across the crosswalks and the roads that you can follow. So you can go to these different places and public meeting places, um, town hall kind of things, um, the old state house and several of them you can go inside and tour if you want um there's like there's a nominal charge for those we again we were maximizing time some of the people in my family have you know a tolerance limit for how much they are interested in tours of that sort of thing if it were just me quite possibly i could have spent a good part of the day doing that but to balance all of the things we didn't actually go into any of the buildings except for Paul Revere's house, which we very much enjoyed and was very interesting. Um, and I highly recommend when I was younger, I I remember going into the old North church when I went as a, like a youngish teenager to Boston. Um, and I remember that being interesting. So, and I don't know that we took the tour back then. I feel like it's, it's possible you could just go into the church and look at it but I think now you have to you have to actually pay even just to get in there was like a like a little lobby area um with the ticket desk or whatever so we only went into the Paul Revere house but that was very interesting and um we snapped pictures all along the way so um in the cemeteries we saw the tombstones for Paul Revere and for John Hancock who was famous for having the largest signature on the Declaration of Independence and um, several other notable figures of the revolutionary era. Um, the gentleman, uh, I can't remember his first name, Dawes was his last name, was one who assisted Paul Revere in his ride to warn of the British coming. Um, the one that struck me um, the most was, um, I forget his first name, but Wheatley is his last name. Um, was buried there. And on the sign in the cemetery, um, it mentioned that uh, Phyllis Wheatley was not buried there. Um, and I was like, ooh, Phyllis Wheatley. I remember reading her poetry when I was young, like for school. We read her poetry and we learned about Phyllis Wheatley. She was the first African American woman to um, publish, to have a published work. She was enslaved at the time that it was published. I remember reading her poetry. I haven't read all of her work, but what I read, I remembered being like very accessible, easy to read poetry um, and enjoying it. And when I got home, I looked up a little bit more of her story that wasn't on the information there at the cemetery. She was manumitted um, shortly after her book of poetry was published, but then like basically everybody in the family um, that had enslaved her, they all had passed away and they were kind of like her benefactors. And so she was kind of like left on her own and with no means to support herself. So she ended up marrying this guy that she had known for a while, but he was kind of like a shiftless, ne'er-do-well sort of guy. And um, they ended up 
living in poverty and debt and she was sick. She, her life ended very sadly. And so then she was ended up being buried elsewhere. And I don't believe that um, initially, uh, like her, I don't think her tombstone had her name or, or anything on it. We didn't go to that funeral ground. So I don't know what her tombstone looks like now. I might have tried to have found it if I had realized that. Anyway, so I kind of went on a quest from that point, like to look for her poetry, but I um, I only found one copy in one of the bookstores and I went to like four different bookstores. I only found one copy in one of the bookstores that I went to and it was just like a, like a basic, inexpensive classic copy, but I kind of wanted a nicely bound one or a nice looking edition of the poetry. So I ordered one off, off of Amazon when I got home. Um, interestingly, and this is the last thing I'll mention because way too many more things to tell you about. Interestingly, um, Phyllis Wheatley originally, even though she had a lot of support from fellow Americans and abolitionists, et cetera, here in America, she um, was unable to publish her poetry here. Nobody would publish her work because she was enslaved. So she actually traveled to London with the son of her master and they traveled to London together and they procured support there from both from prominent Americans who were in London at the time, like Benjamin Franklin, and then some others. And she was able to publish her work in London. And the book that I ended up purchasing uh, was published a few years ago by Renard, which I believe is a UK based publishing company. So again, that is a whole other thing. Um, I have a lot of thoughts about her situation, but suffice it to say, I'm looking forward to getting that book of poetry by her. Anyway, we, we had, a, it was very interesting. I love old cemeteries and I love finding the, the, the sites where, um, different prominent people have been buried. So I enjoyed poking through those cemeteries. I wish they were a little bit better marked because it was, I wish they had like little, I don't know if it's considered disrespectful. So maybe that's why, and I can appreciate that, but I wish there was like little flags or something next to the spots because they don't want you just like tromping through the cemetery, understandably, but it wasn't really very, like there was, there were these occasionally placed like, um, map sort of things saying so-and-so is buried here but it wasn't very clear where here was. And so I didn't want to just like go tromping over all the graves just to find anyway. Um, it was a little bit hard to find exactly who you were looking for, but we found most of the most, most of the ones that we were looking for. And so that was very interesting, the cemeteries. The Old North Church uh, was the steeple where um, Paul Revere asked his friend to post lanterns, one, if the British were coming by land and two, if they were coming by sea. And so um, the steeple that's actually on that church is now the third steeple. So the original steeple that was there back in the Revolutionary War is not there anymore. Natural disasters have um, gotten rid of the others. So now it's on the third one. Um, so that was the Freedom Trail. Highly recommend. That's one of those things, like if you go to Boston, you have to do the Freedom Trail. Like that's the main thing that you do there. Very interesting from a historical perspective as an American citizen, or really I think of interest to anybody because it was so pivotal and important in the Revolutionary War. The site of the Boston Massacre um, is there behind the uh, old state house. Um, also Faneuil Hall is there. And right now it's like an exhibit and kind of a gift shop sort of thing. But if you go to Quincy Market on the other side of it, there are, it's lined with vendors on either side um, and they are selling um, it, kind of like a food court kind of thing. You can get whatever kind of food you want. We got a lobster roll, which was delicious. Um, and this time around, we didn't take the time, but there are, there's a North and a South Market as well. Building is on either side. There's a whole square there by Faneuil Hall. And that uh, is fun to go and um, we were able to rest there and relax and eat our lunch in the beautiful um, seating area that they have. We were glad that we were there when we were there that day because it was packed on a Tuesday at lunchtime and we were, we were thinking to ourselves, what is this going to be like a month or two from now when all the tourists are here? It's gonna be crazy. It was packed already, yeah. So I'm actually glad we went when we did, even though the weather turned out not to be ideal, we still really enjoyed it. So along the way, as we were going through um, 
the Freedom Trail. We made a couple of stops along the way. Um, the lobster roll, first of all, delicious. Um, if you go to Boston, um, make sure you get one. We actually, my husband and I split a meal that was a lobster roll and a, and a bowl of clam chowder. And so that was very enjoyable, quite delicious. We also um, were told to go to Mike's Pastry, which is apparently the place, the place to get cannoli in Boston. Um, but <laughs> when we got there, we were very distracted by all of the other pastries that they had in the case. So we all tried other things. My husband did get a cannoli and I had a little bite of his and it was very good. I'm actually not a big cannoli person, but it was very good. And I will say that the lobster tail cream puff that I got, the, the puff part was a little overdone. Um, like it's supposed to be light and, and fluffy in my opinion. Um, but it was, it was a little bit um, hardened, like it had been overcooked and uh, yellowed is, is like, I, I don't the color of it was like overdone. Um, so, okay, there is some noise going out here. What is going on? I have no idea. Somebody is out there doing something. I can't tell from where I am what they're doing, running some kind of machine out there. So I apologize if the noise is interfering. Anyway, I need to move this right along because so much to do. Along the way, doing the um, the Freedom Trail and where we were walking, there were some other things that we happened across, um, both intentionally and unintentionally, um, which, you know, little sites of interest along the way. But one thing that really struck us was the Holocaust Memorial. And it's just this simple walkway through a little park and um, it's a, a series of like, kind of like towers that you walk through, uh, glass towers. On the glass panels are um, the numbers of that were tattooed on the prisoners in the prison camps and the death camps in um, World War II by the Germans. And as you go through them, like the steam is coming up from grates in the ground underneath you. So it's a very evocative of when the prisoners walked into the gas chambers thinking that they were walking into showers. And um, it was very profound and very moving unexpectedly. I knew it was there. I knew what it was when we walked through it, but just the experience of it was, um, it was very moving and um, brought me to tears uh, just seeing all the numbers on the glass panels and just it really allows you to imagine and to wonder what it would have been like to be um, one of those prisoners in that situation so um, definitely was uh, I'm not going to say something that we enjoyed but definitely something that if you were in Boston take a minute to walk through that won't take long but it's totally worth it. Just like many major cities, there are different neighborhoods in Boston. Um, the Beacon Hill neighborhood is one that has like um, these, you know, like rows of townhouses and it's like a nice area. Some of the streets are like cobblestone streets and um, the a lot of the, the houses have like these beautiful window box arrangements. It's just a fun neighborhood to walk through. There are some boutiques and bookstores. We stopped in a bookstore there. We stopped in a bakery there. Um, that kind of thing. It's that kind of experience walking through that neighborhood. So we walked through there. It was really beautiful. One reason we went through that neighborhood was because in college, I think it was in college, my husband had made this print and I think he was going off of a, of a picture maybe of Acorn Street in Boston. And so he made this and this hanging in our living room. And so uh, we wanted to see the actual street. So we walked down Acorn Street and took a picture there. And um, that was a really fun walk through that neighborhood. And then just um, below that neighborhood is a park called the Public Garden, which it's a, some of the trees were flowering and like the magnolias were blooming, but it wasn't like in full bloom yet. It's still very early spring there, but it was still beautiful to walk through. And I can imagine if you go there in um, full spring or summer, it would be actually just gorgeous. There's a pond there in the summer. Um, I think in May, they start um, the swan boats, which it was too early for that, but that's a really fun thing to do or so I've heard. 
in Boston. But we really enjoyed walking through that park and just enjoying the nature and the animals. And this was all on the first day, by the way, I'm telling you, city in a day. So then we went to um, Boston View, which is at the top of the Prudential Building. And um, it is really, really well done. Um, it costs about the same as any other like high view place in any other city, like 30 something dollars or whatever per person. I've done one or two other similar things, but I feel like this was a really very well done and I feel like you really get your money's worth. So they take you first all the way to the, to, you know, the highest point that you can go. And that is all like enclosed. It's in, in the building. Like you're looking out these, you know, huge windows, but you're inside and you can, and it's a full 360 view all around that level. Um, and then there's even like, um, you can get a little bit higher. I don't know what to call it, like a terraced level that you can go up so that you're still, you know, on the same floor, but it's a little raised and you can get a little bit higher view there um, and walk all around and take pictures. And then they take you down a level and then that level is not enclosed. I mean, well, there's obviously like a wall there, um, like a clear, a clear wall. So you don't go, you know, like, over the side <laughs> that would be bad anyways but it's it's open air and so you can really get the feel of being up there in the air looking at everything it had gotten really chilly and a little bit drizzly by that point so we didn't spend a long time there but that was fun and got some more pictures and then they take you to an inside exhibit where this is really cool and i'll show a video they had like using projectors and lighting and everything. They have like a model of the city of Boston and they show it through different seasons and different times of day. It was a lot of fun. We definitely enjoyed that very much. And then not far from that building is the Boston Public Library, which was probably my biggest surprise of the trip because I knew I wanted to go there um, just because I wanted to go to the Boston Public Library, like going to the the main public library is usually very interesting in a city um, to see. It's usually an older, beautiful building. This was no different, but it was, it was so beautiful. I was not expecting it to be as beautiful as it was. So it's kind of interesting. It had like, um, well, I'll talk more about that in another video, but suffice it to say, thoroughly enjoyed the Boston Public Library and our visit there. Um, just walking through the historic side of the building and seeing the architecture fantastic highly recommend and then um that was all <laughs> all that we did for that day and then the next day we went to the jfk presidential library which is something else that um i we are trying to do is to see um i'm not in any kind of like so systematic way or whatever but it's just kind of a vague goal that we would like to see the presidential libraries because we went to the harris truman one in missouri a couple of years ago when we were on vacation with my family and we really enjoyed that and the exhibits there and um since then we have gone to the woodrow wilson one which i believe is the only one that's in virginia when we were making our plans for Boston and I saw the JFK Presidential Library, I was like, oh, we need to add that one to our list. So we went to that and enjoyed it. I honestly, even though he was more of an iconic, memorable sort of president than either of those other two that I mentioned, um, I wasn't as pleased with that particular library slash museum. But again, I'll talk more about that in another time, in another video. Um, so then we went from there to Concord and to Orchard House to see Louisa May Alcott's house. Also, right down the street from that is a house that was owned by um, Ralph Waldo Emerson and that Alcott's also lived there. And um, another um, female author lived there. Uh, her pen name is Margaret Sidney. I forget what her actual name was. Um, but anyways, so lots of people had lived in that house. It's not open. Well, it wasn't open to the public when we were there. I think it's only open periodically to the public. Um, but you can take pictures of it on the outside. That's called Wayside. That was interesting. So we enjoyed our little visit to Concord. We went to the um, Hot Coffee shop while we were there, which was very good. I enjoyed that. I had seen that on um, Waterbear Reads had posted a video of going to Concord and she had mentioned that. So I was like, ooh. 
got to go there. I also went to a shop there on that little main, cute, super cute little main street. I mean, Concord was, was uh, such a cute little town. I love cute little towns and it was great. It was tiny, but it was cute. And they have a, a shop that sells like all British goods. Ironically, um, has like a whole wall of different kinds of British tea, which um, I just thought that was just humorous. And um, that was a fun little shop. And they there was a chocolate shop that we went into and several other fun shops and a bookstore. So Concord was a lot of fun. We enjoyed that. Um, I would have loved to spend more time there maybe on a warmer, sunnier day at some point. It wasn't exactly warm and sunny when we were there, but it was it was good, we enjoyed it. We went back into Boston and we went to, took the Fenway Park tour, which again, it was very cold and drizzly by that point. Um, it was in the evening and very cold, but everyone in my family, that's like one of the highlights of the trip for them. So I am so glad for them that we went and, um, I learned very interesting things, got a lot of cool pictures of Fenway Park, and uh, it was a lot of fun to hear about the history of it. One thing that, that I thought was really cool was um, on one level, in the bandstand level, grandstand level, the, um, the, the blue wooden seats have been there for like 90 years. Um, same wooden seats, they just like repaint and trim them periodically. Same seats, I think that's so cool. Um, not super comfy, but very cool. And then we went back to the hotel and, you know, wrapped up with swimming and stuff, which was nice. Everybody enjoyed that. Nice relaxing end to a busy day. The next day is when we were going to go to the Norman Rockwell Museum, but there was like a wintry mix kind of weather going on the whole day. And apparently in Stockbridge where the museum was, it was more like actually snowing and they were expecting two to four inches or whatever of snow that day. And so the, museum had a delayed opening and one my husband wasn't too keen on driving in that weather for two hours understandably and two that would have pushed our schedule quite a bit and made us like kind of rushed so we ended up canceling that and instead we went to the museum of fine arts in boston which they have a really nice collection um there was a whole room of monet um which was wonderful, probably one of our favorite places, but they also uh, favorite exhibits in the museum, but they also have had a lot of um, American artists. Um, of course, I can't think of their names at the moment, but um, John Singer Sargent, whose work was also in the Boston Public Library. There was also a couple of Renoir there, Cezanne, other Impressionist artists, Van Gogh, there was one or two Van Goghs there. That was a fun way that was warm and inside and safe that we could spend a couple of hours um, since we had, you know, a whole extra day on our hands that was by that point unplanned, so. And then after we went to the Museum of Fine Arts, we drove down to Quincy, um, which is um, kind of like, I guess a suburb, but I don't know if it's still technically considered Boston or a suburb. And we kind of um, went, to, <laughs> we just kind of wandered around there and did some fun stuff, but we went to the original Dunkin' Donuts location and had Boston cream donuts. Well, at least my younger son and I did because I mean, you're in Boston. So you have to have a Boston cream donut in Boston, right? That's what we did. And then we also, um, stopped and took pictures of because it wasn't open for the season yet but we took pictures of john adams and john quincy adams birthplaces um we had dinner we went to a coffee shop um the drive there was like uh, along the coast of well uh, uh, was it quincy bay there anyway it was beautiful view driving there um to and from quincy into boston so then uh, we went back to Boston to catch our train, but we had a little bit of time to kill. So we sat in a pastry shop called Tate and had some hot chocolate and pastries and just kind of relaxed in the warm, warm coffee shop, pastry shop while we killed some time and then caught our train and we came home. So that was our trip to Boston and all of the fun things that we did. Um, so I was thinking that I would get some reading done because we 
you know, had this long train ride, but I wasn't considering that it was overnight, right? And so I would be wanting to sleep or trying to sleep both times rather than reading, especially the first one, because we caught the train at like 10, 55 at night or something like that. So that was really, and then there was some time in the morning when we were coming into Boston, you know, that I was awake and everything, but then I was like getting ready for the day and stuff. So I didn't get a lot of reading done. Um, I kind of, I read a lot of Les Mis, not a lot, <laughs> not a lot, because not in comparison to how much there is of Les Mis, I did not get very far. Um, so I started working on Les Mis, uh, which is for the Aaron Facers group read. And um, I cannot keep up with other people in that group because they are like zooming through that book. Um, but it's been interesting to hear the discussions that they're having about it. Um, the book is organized strangely. It's in volumes. I think they're like four volumes and then each volume is organized in books and then each book is in chapters. So I have finished the first book in like and a half so far. So that's what I've been working on. I've been introduced to the bishop who honestly, after his initial role here in the beginning of the story is not going to play a key part as far as I remember. Um, but there's, but um, Victor Hugo spends a lot of time introducing us to him and giving us his backstory and getting us to really know him and his character. And then Jean Valjean, we have been introduced to who is the main character and he has come onto the scene and has a very pivotal scene with the bishop, which I have just about gotten to. I haven't quite um, read that part yet. I'm really close to it. So I was reading Les Mis. Um, so that is what I spent a lot of time reading on the trip, but I also wanted to read some things for Alcott April. Um, and I started listening to um, The House of Seven Gables um, on the way, uh, but I fell asleep, um, like, somewhere halfway through the second chapter, I fell asleep as I was listening to the audiobook. When I went back to my Hoopla on my phone, I saw an ebook version that I had borrowed, but not an audiobook version. So I was confused. So I did not get very far in the House of the Seven Gables. While we were on the trip, I picked up a couple of Alcott books. So um, I'll do a little haul here to show you what I got. And then I'll talk about one of these books, which I have read. So this, um, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote um, the poem, Paul Revere's Ride. Now he wrote it just around the time of the Civil War or just prior to it to kind of like inspire um, Americans to be involved in, in the fight. Um, using Paul Revere as an example. So it's kind of like a, a patriotic charge, so to speak. Um, and I guess it's maybe not 100% entirely factual. It's a poem. So this um, version has like some lovely illustrations, full color that you can see. I bought this at the Paul Revere house. So a good, a good pickup for, um, Sorry, the ring light is casting like multiple reflections here. Um, for picture this, 2024. So anyway, so I, I got that. And we did read, we read the Paul Revere ride poem just before we went to his house. And then I got this, which is a collection of short stories. I got this from um, the Orchard House gift shop. And this is the first... Um, yeah, she wrote these when she was just 16 years old. They were originally published in 1898. No, I guess 1898 is when they were originally printed. Okay. But it's one of the first, um, stories that she wrote and she wrote them for Ralph Waldo Emerson's daughter, kind of like to tell tales to tell her. So that's called Flower Fables. And I'm going to read some of those for my short story prompt for, um, Alcott April. And then I got Hospital Sketches, um, also written by Louisa May Alcott. And this is about her account as an army nurse during the Civil War. And she only was able to do that for six weeks. She had signed up for three months, but she got sick with typhoid and pneumonia. So she had to go home, much to her chagrin. And the, because of the calomel with which they treated her, um, she had residual health effects from that for the rest of her life. So she never went back to serve anymore. Um, but this is her experiences. 
And it sounds like such a dire subject. I mean, it, I don't know what you know about Civil War hospitals, but they were not very nice places. And I was expecting like gruesome and whatever. This is not that. This is like, she has such a great sense of humor. And um, she even addresses that in, in here, you know, because I think that people would expect it to be more like gloom and doom sort of narrative. Um, so she even explains, you know, why she doesn't take that approach. Um, it's very humorous. It is touching and moving at times. There are a couple of scenes that she describes with some of her patients that are very moving and um, brought me to tears, but also very funny. I laughed out loud and I was like reading um, pieces of it to, to my husband because I just thought it was so funny. First of all, her trip to get there, traveling from Concord to Washington DC where she was working. Um, uh, that was funny in and of itself, the adventures that she had with that. And then, um, I don't know, it's just her, she's just very funny. A little bit, and a little bit like sarcastic at times. So this is funny, it's a short read. I highly recommended it, I highly recommend it. I read it as um, for the um, nonfiction prompt for Alcott April. I mean, she technically like, people describe it as being lightly fictionalized. I mean, I think that everything in here that happened is is a true account, but she changes names. I think she probably fleshes out a little bit of details of things, um, but it's not a fictional version of her experiences. It's, um, she took the letters that she wrote home and she kind of reworked them into a little story. She, um, the name she gives herself is Tribulation Periwinkle. Tribulation Periwinkle. That's the name she gives herself. And then her older sister, she calls Joan Kubitty. And then her younger sister, Vashti, which it would be Amy, or May is really the name of the sister. Anyway, very funny. So I really enjoyed this. I read this um, as soon as I picked it up at the Orchard House. I started reading it and finished it. Um, it didn't take long. So really enjoy that. Highly recommend. And I also, I don't have it here, but I also picked up some, um, I started reading from the library, some um, works by Emerson. I read some of his poetry, which I enjoyed. The poetry th that was in the volume that I was reading was very short. The Concord Hymn, oh goodness. Now I can't think what the other two were. There were two other poems in this volume, but anyway. Um, the, the poems were, were good, I enjoyed them. Uh, but then I read his essay, Self-Reliance, and I was like, on my good re Goodreads review, I wrote that that was the biggest pile of horse poop I've ever read. It was ridiculous. I completely disagree with it. Um, I guess mostly because my Christian worldview does not permit me to agree with him on basically anything that he wrote in there. Um, it's just completely false, most of it. Uh, there are some kernels of truth in there. There are some very wise statements within the essay, but his overall primary thesis, I would disagree with almost entirely uh, because he is saying that, um, you know, we need to stand our ground on our truth and not be swayed by anyone or anything and we like we, we just each of us needs to own our truth and be true to ourselves etc etc um but he doesn't ever address the fact or the question he doesn't ever address the question what if you in yourself are wrong um he seems to be saying that each of us has a divine truth within us and that we just need to to seize it and stand firmly on it and that it's true and if we if we will stick to that then it will always be right we won't believe anything that's wrong and i think that's what he's trying to say um which to me sounds like another way of saying we can each be our own god and come up with you know uh, we can each have our own truth and it's a divine truth that will always be right i just come disagree with that i think that's a bunch of hogwash personally so anyways um that was my thoughts about emerson's essay um i can't remember if i had ever read that before um i feel like i have read essays by emerson but 
I didn't remember necessarily ever reading that one before. Anyway, so that was my week, both my week of traveling and my week, what I accomplished in reading, which was not a great deal, but um, that's what it was. So I hope you enjoyed a little trip to Boston with me and all that we did. Um, I apologize. I feel like this is going to be probably between 45 minutes to an hour long and I didn't even tell you all of the things. So apologies, please bear with me. And I hope it is enjoyable. I'll divide it up into chapters. So hopefully you skipped around and watched what you wanted to and didn't watch what you didn't want to. And that was it. That was my week. I will talk to you later. Bye.